Perfect. And now I'm making you the host again. Hi there, welcome. Welcome, we're just going to wait a few minutes for some others to join us. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome, welcome. Just going to continue to admit people for just a few moments. All right, just for the um, for an interest of time, and I know that we are live on Facebook right now, so if anyone is watching, um, you know, welcome. I'm going to just jump right in. We will continue to admit people 
um, as they are in the waiting room. And um, yeah, that's it. So my name is Sarah. Welcome to our program today. This is talking to your kids about cancer. Um, I'm from Cancer Care. I'm the director of clinical programs. I'm here with my colleagues, Lauren and Marlene, who are both oncology social workers and program managers at Cancer Care as well. So the first um, little part of our program will be just a, you know, an informational presentation about talking to your kids about a cancer diagnosis. Um, and then after that, we're going to hear from three great panelists who are going to share their experiences. Um, and we have some discussion questions and really, um, you know, the main part of this program will be listening to their stories and hearing firsthand their lived experiences. Um, feel free to put any questions in the chat and we will answer them at the end. So where to begin? Many of you know, talking to your children about a cancer diagnosis is a pretty daunting experience. Um, you know, it might be counterintuitive to share information with your children that might cause worry, fear, or stress. But, you know, we do see that it is most helpful when we are open and honest um, with children and we don't wait too long to share information with them. So this is just a little overview of some of the things that we'll be talking about today, how kids tend to understand cancer based on their age, of course, um, how to communicate openly and have some of these conversations, tips for answering questions, ways to support your child, and of course, some resources. So I'm gonna hand this over to um, Lauren, who's going to talk a little bit about the breakdown in ages of how kids tend to react based on how old they are. Um, it's really, really important when you're having these conversations to keep your child's age in mind. They all have de different um, developmental levels and they're going to understand this differently depending on how old they are. Um, so Lauren, I'll pass this over to you. All right, thanks Sarah and thank you everyone for joining us. I will get us started into breaking down the ages a little bit, starting with the youngest about um, birth to two years old. So we're talking about infancy, toddlerhood. So basically infants and toddlers will not exactly understand what cancer is. However, they may sense changes in routine. They may also sense behavioral and emotional changes of those around them. Common behavioral changes infants and toddlers may experience are increased crying or tantrums, changes in sleeping or eating habits, and difficulty separating from parents or caregivers, separation anxiety. And then moving to preschool age, about three years old to five years old. At this age, children may have some understanding of illnesses such as a common cold. However, they may not be able to grasp the, the understanding of a more serious illness such as cancer. Three to five-year-olds may display magical thinking, which is the idea that a child may believe he or she are to blame or directly may be directly responsible for something. For example, here on the slide, we have, I kept dad awake and he was tired. I think I made him sick. Common behavioral changes preschool age children may experience include regression and that they behave younger than the age that they are or revert to earlier behavioral patterns. They may continuously ask the same questions about cancer and similar to younger children, they may also experience separation anxiety. At this age, play may be used to demonstrate themes related to parents' cancer, such as doctor play and what they're seeing their parent experience. Then going on to school age children, this would be about six years old to eight years old. At this age, children may begin to understand the difference between illnesses, the difference between the common cold and a chronic or more serious, serious illness. Although they may begin to grasp understanding and the severity of illnesses, they may not have accurate information and could believe cancer is contagious. Children at this age may also continue to display aspects of magical thinking. Another example here would be, I was not listening to, I was not listening to dad and when he asked me to stop, I yelled at him. I said some mean things and I think I made him sick. Common behavioral changes school age children may experience include behavioral changes younger children may experience, such as regression, separation anxiety, and doctor play. In addition to these behavioral changes, they may also worry about their parent and fear of contracting disease, asking questions about physical changes observed, such as hair loss from treatment or increased fatigue. They may also display anger, particularly in regards to this 
disruption of their daily routine and what they may be accustomed to. School-age children may also distance themselves from parents diagnosed due to fear or discomfort and latch onto their other parent or guardian. And adolescents, nine to 12 year olds. At adolescence, children may have heard the term cancer more frequently and may have a basic understanding of cancer. However, children at this age may continue to have inaccurate information about cancer, especially accessing incorrect information through peers at school or searching the internet. Throughout adolescence, children may also continue to display aspects of magical thinking. For example, my teachers called my dad because I'm not doing well in school. This has been making dad upset and stressed. I think this made dad sick. Common behavioral changes adolescents may experience include worrying about parent and fear of contracting cancer, as well as others becoming sick, displaying anger, also fear and sadness and those challenging feelings being expressed as anger. Adolescents may also keep feelings to themselves, hiding feelings from loved ones. They may also feel that their family is different than other families because of the cancer diagnosis. And we know at this age, they may not want to stand out or differ from peers, therefore potential feelings of embarrassment may be present as well. And on to teens a little bit older, 13 to 18 year, years old. Teens may be aware of the term cancer and what cancer is. They may have greater knowledge and education related to medical terms and cancer. Teens may also be misinformed about cancer from peers and may Google frequently and attempt to find answers. Teens may also begin thinking about life and death. At this age, teens may have experienced loss of a loved one or know someone who has experienced loss, leading to increased fear and uncertainty. Common behavioral changes teens may experience include continuing to hide feelings and not speaking openly about the impact of the cancer diagnosis, displaying anger, potentially displaying an emotion, any emotion as anger and possibly anger towards loved ones. Teens may feel conflicted between finding one's identity and independence while remaining close to the family during this challenging time, which can definitely be a very intricate balance. And I will now pass it back to Sarah to speak about approaching the first conversation about cancer. So, you know, like we talked about, and that was a lot of information, thank you, Lauren, about the different developmental stages. I know it was quick, but you know your child best. You know your child best in terms of how they receive information, you know, what kind of conversational style they have, um, how they respond to certain things. So I think it's also important to remember it's very individualized. We can give suggestions um, for language based on age, of course, but also you know your child best. So that's also um, something to keep in mind here. But when we're thinking about approaching this conversation and whether it be the first conversation of many, um, you know, or this conversation being broken, up into smaller sections. We know it's scary. We know it's intense. And we, we really want you all to be aware of how you are feeling before this conversation is had. Being aware of your own emotions, right? Asking yourself, what's coming up for me? What is the biggest challenge here? What are my expectations out of this conversation, right? This might be different for everyone. So that's, it's important to kind of take a pause and reflect here. We also want to consider the when and the where, Right. Um, you know, in general, we we kind of suggest a quieter, calmer space, but we also recognize that not all children or teens want that kind of space for them. Maybe they want to maybe, you know, it's in the car on the way home from school. That's their safe place. Or, you know, maybe you're out for a walk and that's their safe space. So that is also important to consider. Think about where your child or your teen may be um, in their best place to hear difficult information. Of course, what to share, and this is age dependent. You know, we're not really talking about um, sharing every single detail, and we'll get to that a little bit later. We're, we're talking about open communication, right? Um, not keeping things from them that they might be already noticing. And in their head, maybe the, the story that they're telling themselves is much worse than the story that you are going to tell them. And so I think it's really important to be careful of the age and realize that a lot of children, um, they are very perceptive and they know more than we uh, give them credit for a lot of times. The language is also really important. Um, you know, at Cancer Care, we have a lot of parents that come and, and talk to us and say, like, what do I tell my child? I, you know, I don't want them to be scared. I don't want them to be worried. And I don't want to use the word cancer. 
we, we understand, we really do. There's a lot of stigma around the word cancer. You know, if you think about many years ago, not even that long ago, actually, the big C, it was taboo. You know, people didn't talk about it and it was automatically a death sentence no matter what. We know that that's not the case now. Yes, there, there are difficult things happening, but we also know that it's important to talk about them and to put them out there. So using words like cancer, chemotherapy, surgery, you know, the words that you were told, you can use these with them too, okay? Um, physical presence and affirmative language. I think it's really important that to realize you're not gonna have all the answers. There's just no way. And being there physically and being there emotionally for them, letting them know that you're there if they need to talk. You're there if they have questions, even if you don't know the answers, right? That's part of the open communication that and um, something that you can kind of set in motion with your kids. Now, when we're talking about actually explaining the cancer diagnosis, again, this is really gonna be dependent on the age of your child, okay? Um, we want to make sure that we're trying to explain it to them in a way that they, they will understand. Um, you know, there are books, and this is something that we can also, um, you know, share that there are books that you can use talking to children about a cancer diagnosis that help with language. You can also um, you know, reach out for additional support, but we wanna speak in words that are familiar and common to your child, okay? Um, again, you don't need to share every detail. It's not always going to be necessary, but it is important to be you know, honest and as accurate as you can be in the way that they will understand. Um, again, using the word cancer, it's really important. And I think too, um, you know, based off of the things that we were kind of hearing from Lauren about the de developmental differences, a lot of younger children, they hear sick and they think cold, they think flu, they think, am I going to catch this? Is this contagious? You know, um, and it's really difficult when children can't differentiate between the common cold and cancer. There really needs to be that separation. And I think that this is where it starts, right? These conversations. Um, remember that it doesn't just need to be one conversation and actually many times it's not. It's a conversation that evolves over time. You might have it more than once. You might have it in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, there's no perfect way to do it. I think that if you are aware enough and that you need, know you need to have this conversation, that is the first step, being there and being open to talking about it with your children. Um, you know, consider using simple and concrete terms, right? Simple and concrete language, especially for younger children. Um, an example, mom is sick with an illness called cancer. The cancer happened on its own. Nobody did anything to make it happen. My doctors are doing the best they can to take care of me and I'm going to do everything possible to get better. You know, we wanna stay away from words like, I promise I'll be okay, right? That is the hope. That is of course the hope for anyone diagnosed with cancer, but that's not something that you can promise a child. I think that letting them know that you're gonna do everything, you know, you or your loved one's gonna do everything that they can um, in this case, you know, to get better. And when we're talking about discussing treatment and treatment schedules, again, it might seem counterintuitive to give your child so much information about what's happening. You might think, do they really need to know when I'm going to chemo, when I'm getting scans, you know, when this is happening. Now, the amount of information is of course up to you. But when we talk about really discussing treatment and treatment schedules with kids, um, what you need to know is that the, what's going to be affected the most is their daily routine. And that usually is what makes them feel safe, supported, um, the consistency of their routine. And so if treatment is going to change, who picks them up from school? Who's gonna drive them to practice? You know, who's gonna be there for them on X day or event or time? You know, it's really important that you kind of think ahead of some of these situations and plan for these things so that you can let your child know or your teen know that yes, there are going to be some changes happening, but no matter what, we are here together, we're going to make this work and we're gonna come up with a plan. So, you know, really talking to your children and asking what that means to them, reassuring them that you're gonna keep them updated and that if they are scared or they have questions, of course, that's okay. Um, discussing how the routine might change um, and preparing them for what treatment entails, like Lauren said, like the, the side effects. You may or may not lose your hair. You may or may not have certain side effects that your child is going to notice. Um, but it's really important to try to be upfront about some of these things because we do see children, you know, having a lot of fear around some of these visual side effects that they weren't really told about uh, beforehand. And we see that disrupting the parent-child relationship. It's not impossible to repair, but it's very difficult sometimes to be in that place. Um, 
Also helping children understand that treatment and side effects might limit some of your activities. That might mean that explaining that it's not that you don't want to play or read or go or go for a walk or shoot hoops outside. It's that the medicine that you're taking, the treatment that you're taking is making you feel a particular way. And, you know, for right now, it's just not something that you could do or that your loved one can do. Um, it's, it is important to have those conversations because children tend to internalize changes in behavior around them. If all of a sudden you, you know, can't play as much, but they don't know why, they're going to think they did something. They're going to internalize that and think this is a reflection of me. Um, and oftentimes, I mean, almost always, it's not a reflection of them. It's a reflection of what's happening in the family. And I'm going to pass this on to Marley so she can talk about, um, you know, throughout care and supporting children that way. Thank you so much, Sarah. So yes, um, there's going to be a lot of adjustments happening after receiving the initial diagnosis and also, of course, throughout treatment. So it's so important to stay connected and involve your children uh, in your care throughout the course of your treatment. So something that can be really helpful and it's really important is building a strong support network. So that might be um, involving your family members, friends, maybe even talking to your children's guidance counselors at school so they have extra support there. Don't be afraid to ask for help. It's okay to delegate. I know as parents, you're used to doing everything on your own and you know you want it to be that way, but it's okay to ask for help. And there are certain tasks that you can give to family members or friends that will take some things off of your plate. Schedule family update meetings. So as Sarah said, it's so important to give regular updates. So maybe that's once a week, once every other week, just to make sure if there are any questions, any changes in the treatment plan, your children are aware of those changes and there's no surprises. If possible, bring your children to your treatments or allow them to visit you if you're at the hospital. So a lot of times, as mentioned earlier, kids have a big imagination. They can imagine something a lot scarier than what's actually happening when you go to the treatment or if you go to the hospital for a visit. So maybe if you can bring them, it will actually um, clear up maybe some of that fear and anxiety they may be, might be experiencing when picturing what's actually happening at the hospital. Um, you might want to give them simple tasks that might help them feel useful. So maybe they can make you breakfast in bed um, or help you keep your um, you know, appointments in your calendar, whatever it might be to help them stay involved. Make sure you're considering any role reversals that might be occurring throughout the course of your treatment and be aware of special considerations for teenagers. Um, as we know, uh, teens have access to the internet these days, so there's a lot of information out there. So making sure that you're keeping an eye on that and making sure that you are telling them, you know, whatever you want to share before they're able to look it up elsewhere. And also, it's so important to try to spend relaxed, stress-free time with your children. So if that means maybe carving out once a week time where you don't talk about cancer, but can maybe watch a movie or read a book together, whatever it might be, do some coloring or artwork um, where you really have that quality time that cancer is not involved in. So open communication, um, that has been you know, a, a theme throughout the course of this presentation. Communication really is key and being open and honest really helps the family cope with whatever changes might be coming ahead. So again, continue those open lines of communication at every phase of the journey, um, whether that's first diagnosed to treatment to even post-treatment. Uh, provide updates to your children in developmentally appropriate ways, which we touched on earlier. Be sure to validate and provide reassurance to the feelings your children are expressing. Of course, we want them to talk about how they're feeling. So any kind of positive reinforcement that you can give to let them you know, know that it's good that they're talking and expressing how they're feeling, no matter what that might be, is so important. And it's also okay for you to show that emotion too, because it helps them realize you're human and that it's okay. Um, if they have trouble talking about cancer, maybe they're nervous to bring it up, they're, they're scared if they bring it up, they might upset you, um, encourage them to write down questions and concerns. Something I suggest to some of my clients is creating a question jar with their children so they can put it in maybe the family room or the kitchen. So if they have any questions, they can put a question in there and you know maybe once a week you can go and collect the questions and, and go through them during your family meeting. And um, if there are questions you don't know the answer to, it's okay to be truthful and let them know that you're not sure. And you can find that out for them or you can find that out together and go over it then. 
So emotional support, as we know, a cancer diagnosis is incredibly overwhelming, and it's so important to secure any additional support that you can for yourself and for your children. So you might be able to find individual support, you might be able to do family counseling, maybe there are even support groups available. Um, definitely try to connect with the hospital social worker to see what's available, or any local cancer organizations that might be able to offer support. So again, encourage your children to express any feelings or concerns that they might be having. Um, there are no wrong feelings and letting them know that is really important. Um, be mindful of any emotional changes that your children might display that, you know, might indicate that they're stressed or worried. Um, so I know Lauren went through some of those behavior changes um, earlier on, but also, um, you know, if your children are in school, staying connected with their teachers, maybe the guidance counselor to see if they also are noticing any changes in behaviors. Discuss outlets with your children so they that they can utilize when maybe they're feeling upset or over, overwhelmed. So maybe that might mean taking them out for a walk or showing them maybe that if they're feeling overwhelmed, they can draw or color or maybe even write or journal for some of the older children. Those are all great options. Allow space for them to feel heard. So again, creating that space to have open communication is really important. Model and explain aspects of self-care. So again, things that you're doing for yourself, how can you help your children have similar outlets? So again, might be going for a walk, coloring, drawing, anything along those lines, listening to music. There are so many options available that are children friendly. And continue to instill your foundation as a family and approach challenges as a team. We want this to be a team effort. And moving forward, so of course, there are so many unknowns when managing a cancer diagnosis. So even when treatment is over, there are still many adjustments, many challenges that continue to occur. Um, so as we know, um, even I think a lot of times in, in TV and movies and media, once cancer treatment is over, a lot of people believe that that's the end of all of the troubles, but that really isn't the case. So be sure to continue that open communication, even you know, after treatment is completed. And again, be honest with them, even if the news isn't what you were hoping, make sure they hear whatever that news is um, directly from you because the source is really important. You don't want them to hear from a, a friend or maybe an extended family member. And make sure they're aware of what might be down the road. So maybe that is talking about, you know, your prognosis or whether you're in remission or maybe you experienced a recurrence. So again, explaining those terms in um, language that is appropriate with their age. All right. And I'll turn it back to Sarah for a recap. Thanks so much, Marley. Um, and just to recap, you know, some of the things that we went over, um, you know, like I said before, children here understand more than we realize. I'm sure you've all heard children are sponges or you've seen it with your child, you know, maybe repeating words that they shouldn't be repeating before they even know what they are, but you know, they're always listening and it's really important to be mindful of how you're talking about this around them um, and also with them. How you share information with your kids is more important than what you share. And meaning that, you know, the environment that you have your children in, being validating and acknowledging their feelings too, you know, that is more important sometimes than the content, them knowing that they're not alone in this. Um, considering your child's age, which, you know, we have to drive that point home, it's really important. Um, before sitting down to talk, again, an environment that makes your kids feel safe, you know what that is. Being honest, using simple and direct language, giving enough space to ask questions, leading, letting their questions lead the conversation and also not being afraid to say, I don't know. You know, it's, it sometimes can be more powerful to let your child know that actually, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm going to find out and I'll get back to you. And then when you get back to them and you let them know either you found the answer or you didn't, it really instills trust. It instills this sense of belonging to them, excuse me, in terms of, you know, their experience and them in taking information from you. Um, give yourself permission to cry and give your child permission to cry. I know that it can be very uncomfortable to be vulnerable in front of children, um, especially if this is new, especially if this is something that you might not have done before. Um, I'm not talking about, you know, full on breakdown, sobbing, can't breathe sort of cry. Um, I do think that there is a line 
sometimes because children can be scared by very intense emotions that they haven't been um, shown before. However, you know, of course you're human, we're human. And when you talk about difficult things, it brings up emotions and it's completely okay to let yourself do that. And if your child says, I don't want to cry, remember that it's completely okay. It's expression of feelings and there's nothing wrong with it. And then validate, 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 validate. Anything that they're feeling is okay to feel. You don't have to take their feelings, their pain, their anxiety, their worry from them. You can let them know that it's okay, that you are here to make them feel safe. Or if they don't feel safe, ask them what would help, what would help them make, make them feel supported or heard. And if it's not you, is there someone else in your support network that they want to talk to about this? Maybe they have questions that they wanna ask, they're afraid to ask you for whatever reason. And that's okay. We want to be flexible and really, you know, let the child or the teen lead in some of these cases. Um, and so that is basically the conclusion. And we just want to shout out our sponsors really quickly. Thank you for supporting um, and for giving back to this wonderful program. And, you know, we're going to do questions more, some more Q&A at the end. But for now, what we're going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to meet our um, panelists. And so, okay. So what we're going to do before we kind of jump into some questions that we have for our panelists, I'm going to invite them to just do a brief introduction so that you have some context about their stories and about where they're coming from. Um, and so tonight we have Christy, Tanya, and Julie here with us. Um, so I don't wanna single anybody out. So if there's someone who wants to volunteer to introduce themselves first, we can go ahead and start. I'll go first. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Christy Leonard. Um, my husband, Tony Leonard, was diagnosed with stomach cancer at 39 years old. Our, we have five boys together. Well, in a blended family, but they're still my boys. Uh, the youngest was 18 months old. The oldest was 19 years old um, at age, or when uh, Tony was diagnosed. So everything that has already been discussed as far as the age groups, I went through each and every single one of those. Unfortunately, I went through it twice. Tony did have a reoccurrence five years after um, multiple surgeries and chemotherapy and things of that nature. Um, and I was Tony's primary caregiver through the seven-year journey. Um, and it was a, a family journey. I like to say that it was our whole family unit that was involved. And, um, but unfortunately, we lost Tony um, January 22nd, 2019. Um, and the hope is that you know, no stone was left unturned. And now it's, you know, sharing all of everything that I've experienced, our family's experience with others. Um, you know, I, I wish there was something like this, you know, seven years ago, eight years ago. So, um, but the kids are doing well. So thanks to everyone who's here. Thanks so much, Christy. Tanya, do you want to go next? Okay, there I am. Hello, everyone. My name is Tanya McKay. Um, my husband was diagnosed with stage four stomach ca um, cancer at the age of 44. We had three children. Um, at the time, they were 16, 11, and three, all girls. Um, I also was my husband's primary caregiver. He was diagnosed um, on a Friday, and by Wednesday, we were told it was terminal. So we started with a terminal diagnosis from the very beginning. And um, everything in the slides that you guys just expressed was so spot on with what we um, encountered. And like Christy, it would have been great to know that stuff in advance. So I really am very appreciative that you guys are taking the, the time to put this out there for families that are going through it going forward. Um, I too had the gamut of ages. Um, I skipped everything except for the, the, the birth to two. Um, Christy got that one, but I, got, I did get the other ages and, um, and different experiences different school environments and whatnot. I had some in homeschool, some in preschool, some in virtual schools, like all over and, and whatnot. So um, Jeremy had uh, fought his cancer for 14 months and passed away in November of 2019, shortly after I met Christy and the team there. So, but thank you again for doing this. Hi everybody, my name's Julie. Um, my story is my perspective slightly different in that I actually have two sons who actually had stomach cancer. Um, so my experiences started in 2015 
when my 20 year old was having all kinds of symptoms that seemed to be stomach related and they just couldn't find anything um, within a matter of three days of being admitted into the hospital because he couldn't breathe. He actually passed away from cardiac duress. The, what we la learned later was that the stomach cancer had actually spread to his bones and his lungs and it literally took it to spreading for them to even find it. Um, and so you can imagine that was so very fast, we couldn't even process what was happening. But as soon as I started uh, trying to investigate why would a 20 year old even get stomach cancer, um, one, of the, one of the organizations was Debbie Stream and it became clear that there might be something genetic impacting my family. So I immediately had my 17 year old daughter and my 13 year old son tested. My daughter was negative. Uh, but my 13 year old son was positive with the same mutation. And um, this particular mutation is extremely aggressive and it has a very high rate of getting stomach cancer. Um, we're starting to see more patterns in younger people like we did with my son. Um, so the immediate course of action was to get him under surveillance and start monitoring and to proactively have his stomach removed it, um, so he wouldn't get stomach cancer because the risk was so high. And so in that process of um, monitoring it and making the decision that around 18 or 19, he would have a surgery, they actually found stomach cancer um, on his annual exam uh, when he was 17. So it expedited the process of having a total gastrectomy. Um, that happened uh, two years ago. He's doing well, he's 19 now. Um, and so uh, just a variety of emotions and hidden in between all of the pain are lots of little blessings. So, um, and it's an ongoing healing process, I believe, probably for all of us. Thank you so much, Julie. And thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, and now that we have a little bit of background, I'm just gonna jump into some questions. Um, and you know, the first question is really, how did you approach talking to your children about this? Um, I know that you all have different experiences. And so I'm gonna start with Christy, if that's okay. I know that you, have, you mentioned you have five boys and lots of different ages. Um, so why don't you just go ahead? Yeah, so Sarah, thank you again. Um, so the first time that we told everybody um, that the two youngest, Aiden and Ashton, they were 18 months old and three, almost four. So they didn't really understand what was going on and, and we didn't say anything to them. So we told each of the boys individually, we told the oldest and you know he cried and he was 19 and he had just come off of working the night shift and, and just kind of knew something was going on because of the way we came back from the doctor's office. He's just pretty smart, smart young man. The other one, um, Austin, he was 11 at the time and he was really holding everything in. And I sat down with him and I just said, hey, like, you know, um, that has cancer. There's really no easy way to say it. And he was really like, what? And I had just lost my brother to lung cancer. So they were like, same thing, C word equals death, right? Um, and I finally looked at him, I said, you know, it's okay to cry. And then he cried. So, I mean, really like everything that you've, you've touched on the slides is real. The hardest one that we told the time was, was Alec. He was, was 15 at the time. And um, he, him and his dad were, you know, super, they, Tony had a very unique relationship with all the boys, but he was right in the middle of like high school and, you know, sports and, and all of that. And so Tony actually told him and, um, you know, he was like, daddy's sick. And he was like, well, how sick? And he said, I have cancer. And he was like, what? <laughs> they like freaked out and ran upstairs and called his friends because that's what they do. Fast forward five years, we had just celebrated Tony's anniversary. So we were like, hey, it's five years. He made it. Da, 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 da. When we found out there was a recurrence, we actually sat down. Um, the oldest was, you know, moved out of the house. So we had told the four together as a unit. And we just said, there's no easy way to say this. And the two older ones already knew. You could see them getting emotional. The little ones at this point knew what cancer was and actually asked what stage it was. That's how much they knew because we were just, you know, so communicative. I will tell you this though, um, and, and I, I don't wanna, you know, go off topic or whatever, but um, I will say when we told the boys the second time as a, as a unit, um, 
the way they processed it was a little differently. Alec ran upstairs, grabbed his coat, his keys, you know, ran out the house. I had to stop him and hug him. Austin wouldn't cry until he got a hold of his dad and the little ones just like latched onto me, you know? And so it was just kind of like whoever they felt was their support system at that time. But the little ones, they just, when they were little, little, they just knew daddy had a boo-boo and that's all they really kind of understood was daddy had a boo-boo. So I don't know. That was kind of what we went through. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, Tanya, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience? Yes. So um, when my husband was um, originally diagnosed, he had no symptoms. So he wasn't sick. He wasn't not really feeling good or anything like that when we found out. And one of the first things him and I discussed when we found out was, well, what are we going to tell the kids? And, and just a knee jerk reaction is we tell them everything because I do know that kids fill in the blanks and I didn't want them to fill it incorrectly. So literally we just walked in the door. We called the three girls, including the three-year-old all into the kitchen. And we said, Hey, point blank. We were just told dad has cancer. And this is our game plan. We I walked them through how my day went. I started at the doctor's this morning. This is what the doctor said. This is the information she gave us. Then we went here. We did this. Then we went to the cancer center because they already made us an appointment. This is what they said. And next week on Monday, we're doing this. And on Wednesday, we're doing this. And then we basically said, it's brand new to us. And do you have any questions? And, and that's how we approached everything from the very, very beginning. And the three of them are very, very different. Um, I, I love the part where you said that they, that the imagination that they have um, immediately, my little one wanted to just do whatever daddy was doing. Um, and my middle one wants to process on her own in her room. And then I have to kind of come in there and say, Hey, I'm here. Talk to me. Um, let's talk about it. And that it's okay to cry and I'm going to cry, but crying all day is not going to help us. So let's figure out what, how we can move on with this. So, and then my oldest one is just, it, they were self-declared best friends. So she just kind of stepped up to trying to mini mom the rest of the family and help out with everything. But yeah, I think the um, being just as honest as you can be, because I, I didn't want them to feel like there was ever going to be a trust issue. I didn't want them to think that I was sneaking information around their back or, or anything like that. And I, I remember even telling my middle one one day when I said, hey, we've got new test results. And she said, um, I said, do you want to know or not? And she says, no. And I said, OK, but we're going to talk about it. And you're going to overhear it. So do you want to hear it now when you can ask me questions or do you want to hear it in bits and pieces as we talk? And she was like, yeah, just give it to me now. So um, I do believe that that open communication is so big because you want them to be able to feel like they can come to you. So, but, and we only had the, the initial talk um, and then just all the updates through the process for him. Thank you so much. Anna. And Julie, I know your situation is a little bit different, but I also think it's so important to hear this perspective, how real it is. So can you tell yeah, us? So with Billy, my 20 year old, it literally the, it happened so quickly. So clearly something was wrong in the hospital. And I think my approach, because it was so much to take in and we didn't even have all the information, I started with bits and pieces. I knew it was gonna be this ongoing stream. We knew there was some sort of cancer, but we didn't know exactly what yet from the tests that they were doing. So I started with, they think it may be cancerous. We don't know for sure yet. So I felt that initial absorption or processing could help as I started to give more information. And that's exactly what happened by the time we were actually talking about it being cancer and, and hearing the doctors talking to us, they were, the information he was absorbing, he, he, he interpreted the way he needed to, and we interpreted it as we knew it to be, which was, this was not good and very aggressive. And we knew what that meant where he heard what he needed to, which was, I have cancer, I'm gonna fight this. And that was all he needed in that short window of time. So that brings me a lot of peace knowing that he didn't really get to process the end result. With my 13 year old, this was, this was quite different because he was tested positive at 13. And I already knew potentially how it was going to go. And I knew at the end of the road, he was going to have to have a stomach taken out at an early age, at eight, probably 18. And when do I share this information with him? You know, it, it, again, I think it's going to be in pieces. And I, I, he was going to be going for annual exams. So I had to start with something. And I, again, he's a 13-year-old boy. I think he was in the sixth grade. 
And I tried to explain to him as simplistic as I could that he had the same gene that was kind of messed up that his brother had, but the, you know, but the good news is we know it and we can make sure what happened to your brother doesn't happen to you. That was it. That's all I was trying to get Tim to know was about this gene, not stomach cancer or anything like that. He went to school the next day and told everybody he had stomach cancer. So there's not anything I could have said differently. I was very, you know, so I don't feel guilty, but it did help me understand where he was in a from maturity standpoint that, okay, this is going to be slow going and that's okay. We had some time. And then I realized if he, if these things are happening and he's getting scopes done and, you know, he knows he's got this gene, he might wake up one day and have a question. And then I thought, if he asks me anything, I know he's ready to hear information. And he never did. He just went along with whatever we were doing. And maybe because mom's got me and, and you know, so if there's something I need to worry about, that'd be the case. But once I realized for myself that, because it's a struggle, you, when do I, when is the, when's the day going to come? And I'm going to tell him what's going to happen to him. And I just thought, he could wake up tomorrow at the age of 14 and, and say, hey, what if, what if they find something? And then I would know that was my time to go ahead and share with him what was going to happen. And fortunately and unfortunately, um, that part didn't happen until we got to that point where she found something. And then again, at, at 17, I said, she saw a few little spots. We don't know what it is yet. They're going to look at it. So it, I get, did those pieces again. Um, talked a little bit about if it's, if it is stomach cancer, then what most people do, because it's the best way is to have your stomach taken out. So I, I kind of fed him in a long conversation. These things could happen. We don't know yet, but this, lots of people do it. So it was a lot of positive we're going to be fine, you know, all, all of that. And that was an emo that was our emotional moment of anything was that particular conversation. And they do, both of them have looked at me when they get this information and you can see all this emotion and you have to say, it's okay to cry. And then the crying comes, whether, you know, regardless of the age and that needs to happen for them just to get that initial part out. And then telling him the yeah, other was actually cancer really was a secondary note because he had already understood the what ifs. So um, that was the beginning of that part and um, the hardest part of it, but it pieces, I think, but every child's different, right? You just, my daughter, if it had been her, she would have asked me a million questions and I would have gave it all to her. So it just really depends on the child. You can have two of them the same age and they just are different. So it's, it's a, it's a personal decision you guys have to make with your own children. Um, and, and it could be, it could work well and it could not, but you, you just do the best that you can. It'll, it'll all work its way out that way. Yeah. Thank you so much, Julie. And you really referred a lot to like basically the evolving of this conversation, right? It wasn't just one conversation. You had to have many different types of conversations because of the situation. I'm thinking too, like Christy and Tanya, when you're talking to your children, obviously it wasn't just once. Christy, you had multiple conversations too, but how did it affect them like throughout the treatment? Was it something that you revisited as a family, these conversations? Were there check-ins? Um, can you talk a little bit about like what the in-between was like? Sure. So the first time around, I feel like I made a big mistake by not being open and honest. And, and I've said this before, um, you know, I felt like I'm, you know, I'm mom, I'm a protector, right? I had to protect my kids. Um, and I wasn't transparent with the older ones to, to really let them know the seriousness, the seriousness of the extent of their dad's disease. And um, I regret that. I, I truly do. Because when it did come back, it was, well, dad beat it the first time, so he's definitely going to beat it again. And it wasn't to take that hope away. You know, it was, it was just, I, I wish they, you know, when we know everything, then we, sometimes we, we have opportunities to make different decisions on how we're going to spend our time, right? So the day-to-day -day for me was, um, <laughs> oh, it was a lot, but we're a football family, right? So we would discuss chemo 
schedules affecting whether or not they would dad would show up to the football games or baseball games or if he could still coach or not um and so we always did chemo either monday or friday um because he had so many steroids in him um then he could get through like the next few days the chemo didn't bother him until like a week out um and then you know it was hey uh older boys i need you to help me get the younger ones on the bus um we broke all the rules it was dad's having a bad day so we're gonna have pizza in the bed tonight you know um that was the second time the first time i tried to keep everything like it was normal and it was fine and everything would be okay and tony had the too easy mentality and while everyone else was doing perfectly fine and this isn't a caregiver panel but i was not i was keeping it all to myself and 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 i just wish you know i tell everyone i fortunately Unfortunately, fortunately, I had to do, to do it again. So I learned from my mistakes the first time. Were there check-ins? Anytime we went to, uh, to the hospital. Um, and when he would be in the hospital, there was a time he was in the hospital for 19 days. And um, I always stayed in the hospital. And it was the first time I was like, I need to go home for a couple of days. I got to spend time with my kids. The people were great. They brought the kids up to the hospital. They would take their shirts off and socks off and crawl right into bed with Tony, you know? Um, They'd ask about all the different things. I bought doctor kits when they were little. They used to play doctor with dad. Um, one of them took a Sharpie and drew scars all over his body to mimic what his dad looked like. We just made it a family affair, you know? I mean, it is what it is. We can either embrace it and keep living or we could hate it and make it a, oh, now we gotta have the family talk. You know, we, we chose to embrace it and say, yep, scan sucks, so we're gonna keep it moving and, and keep it going. Thank you so much, Christy. Tanya, did you have a similar experience about the check-ins? Yeah, I think the broad strokes were more of a family basis. It was, hey, we've got this appointment today. Hey, we're doing another PET scan next week, so we should know how far along we are, if the chemo's working, not working, what the next, or these la we're expecting these labs. But the individual conversations happen more organically with the kids. Um, like I would step outside and be doing something outside, and, and the oldest one would walk out there with me. And I literally just look at her and go, I, I, I can't believe this is happening to us. Like I, I utterly was like, I, I, I can't believe this is happening to us. And, and then we would talk about it and have actual conversations about how it's affecting us all the time. Same thing, you know, if I'm in the car with my middle one, it's just us. And I'm like, so what do you think? Like what, what's happening? And the little one, and, and my little one liked to mimic, you know, dad got a feeding tube pretty quickly. He lost 20 pounds, I think within the first month of diagnosis. And she was like, I want to be like daddy. So I had to hook up a baby monitor and stick the little port under her shirt and put the baby monitor up here. And I was like, just like daddy, you have a feeding tube. And, and um, so, yeah, I think the individual conversations happen more organically. I, don't, I didn't wake up that morning and say, oh, I, I need to make sure I talk to Tegan about this. or I need to make sure I talk to Addison about this. Or what if everyone asked me this? It was more like just conversations, just checking in with my kids and talking. Um, but the what was happening was always a broad stroke with the whole family. This is what's on tap for this week. We're going to start radiation this week, or we're going to do this this week, or dad, this is how. And my husband, um, he changed dramatically very quickly in the, the illness. He he didn't want that. He didn't want to keep talking to the kids. So everything what kind of came through me. So um, I would be the one to say, hey, listen, this is what's bothering dad. This is something that's affecting him. This is where we'll probably want to be a little bit more um, sensitive to about things or, or things like that. So I kind of navigated both of those, but I think a lot of it's just entrusting your instincts and, and let, letting some of those conversations happen organically and basically waking up and accepting the fact that nothing's going to throw you off your game that day. It's, it's going to come from any direction. Just don't, don't show that you're frazzled with your kids because that does give them a feeling of mistrust and just be like, okay, well, whatever comes my way, we're, we're going to, we're going to tackle it. But I think a lot of it happens organically. Like Christy said, okay, you know, it doesn't feel good today. We're going to have pizza in bed. Um, and mine was pretty much, you know what? I don't, I don't care what you eat. I mean, anything, if it's in here, it's not toxic. Just open the fridge and get something if you want it. Like if that makes you happy, go ahead. Um, and just letting go of that, that rigidity that I think some parents have, you, you really have to choose those battles and say, where do you want to put your focus right now? Do you want to put your focus in keeping those guidelines or do you want to put your focus more into the communication and, and tapping into your kids emotionally and things like that? I just think that those are choices you have to make as um, a parent navigating that to be a little bit more fluid with your day-to-day -day activities. 
Absolutely. And what I'm hearing across all three of you is, you know, the importance of the openness, the ongoing openness. It wasn't just like, hey, here's what's going on. And then you shut down and kept them out and then only updated them like, you know, a little bit. You really, it was an, an ongoing conversation. And I really think that that makes all the difference here. You know, um, obviously, I'm sure there are things that you know, we would want to change, but at the same time, like you say, show up and do the best that you can, do the best that you can for your, for your kids. And, you know, Christy mentioned something about caregivers, and although it's not a caregiver panel, you all were caregivers, and you know what it's like. So I do think it's important to touch on that too, and talk about, you know, anything that you would suggest to new caregivers, or, you know, in a similar situation. Is there something that you wish you would have known, or, something that was really helpful to you in the beginning that you just like, you need to share. Um, Cause I think that that would be, that would be great. Yeah. yeah I, I, oh, <laughs> go ahead, Julie, go ahead. Go ahead no, I was just going to say, uh, certainly we didn't have those kinds of conversations. I had four years to prepare for what was going to happen with Joey. Um, but I used every ounce of that time to get smart, to connect with the right organizations and, and, and figure out how things were gonna be and who are we gonna do it with and all of that. But I knew early on that the counseling was gonna play a vital role for myself and for him. So after we learned he was had that genetic uh, mutation, um, I got him into counseling and I got myself into counseling. So I spent many years just really one grieving, one child, and we're not done. We've got to work on, it's got this other thing we got to do over here, um, but got him in, um, to start a relationship with somebody, um, talk about nothing, talk about boy things, right? And just to establish this relationship with somebody. So what, when the time came, he had somebody he could talk to that wasn't mom um, and that he had already formed a real bond with. And I can't tell you for us how, how just critical that was because he ended up getting cancer and all these and he still sees her now two years later now it's once a month they they are on the phone with each other now they just talk about video games but the the whole point is he made that connection with somebody um so that whatever he needed to share most of the time it had nothing to do with what was happening to him he just had this connection and i i think that was huge for for us and for many people it could be absolutely that's a great point um, Tanya, did you want to go ahead? Well, yeah, we were talking about, um, you know, as the question was in regards to being a, a caregiver. Um, and I think, I think what I, I think my big takeaway was the meet literally the day he got diagnosed, I was on the internet, but I wasn't researching the cancer. I was looking for groups and people who have already got the information. I was like, I'm not going to spend any of my time reinventing the wheel. Somebody's already done the research. Somebody already knows vast more than I'm going to get in this very small period of time. And that's how I found Debbie's dream. Because I literally was, I didn't need to know the specifics of the cancer. I needed to know who's going to help me through the information. And I think that some people, depending on the type of personality you are, you know, type A's and whatnot, and they want to figure everything out. And I think you have to let go of some of that control and be like, if somebody's already done that work, I'm going to let them download that into me because I need to focus my energy on taking care of my loved one or taking care of my family. So I'm not going to spend hours and hours and hours in front of the computer trying to figure out what that lab result means or what this lab result means. I'm going to plug into people that have walked through this um, in organizations like Debbie's Dream, multiple different you know, uh, Facebook groups. And I'm going to say, what did you get from this? What did you learn from this? What did, and so much was given to me. Ask about this, look into this. It's just like Julie found out about the genetic mutation because of Debbie's dream. She could have read oodles on the internet before she found that. I think a lot of people need to be very selective about how you spend your time and let people, reputable people, reputable organizations download information into you so you can spend more of your time focusing on the caregiving. I think that's really important as a caregiver so that you have you can juggle that not just yourself, your children, who you're taking care of, your your loved one, but not spend so much time trying to decipher all the codes that are in the medical world. That's me personally. Anyway. Absolutely. Tanya, I love what you said, and I'm over here laughing inside because I was totally researching everything on the internet. <laughs> I was like, well, I would I would take his lab results and I would like 
look at them and, and he was sleeping and the kids were at school. So I was like, you know, whatever. Um, I probably should have been working or something, but I was too focused on um, trying to control something that I had absolute no control over because it's, it's the little things that, you know, we, you know, I always would tell people I, I was better and more organized when, you know, on chemo days and when Tony would be in the hospital and because it was like, I can make sure that the laundry was getting done and I can make sure meals were planned and I could arrange car, you know, carpools and all that kind of stuff um, that I had control over. I had no control over what was going on in his body, right? Um, however, the, the caregiver spouse relationship that, that you're talking about, um, Sarah, is a very, it's a very unique relationship. Um, and and I, I wrote about this, right? About how, um, he wasn't the man that I fell in love with. He changed, but he became a completely um, amazing man that I completely got to fall in love with all over again in a different light. Um, I used to get frustrated over, you know, I think I got frustrated over money all the time, but I would get frustrated when he was healthy because he didn't unload the dishwasher. Then now I got a pass. You know what I mean? Um, those little arguments didn't seem to matter. Um, but my advice or my experience, um, second time I scheduled time for myself. So I would schedule the, the day trips to the spa. Um, and that was really important. So I could schedule like when the kids had to go to the dentist and when, you know, Tony had to go somewhere, but I had to schedule me time. Right. Um, and I still need to do work better at that. Um, and the other thing is I always like to say, don't forget, who you're fighting for and the reason that you're fighting. Um, because at the end of the day, um, it's that relationship is why we're fighting. Because if you could care less about the person, then it's just, you know, it's just a, a, a checklist, right? Or, um, you know, I'm going to pass on some information and, and, and I hope it works out for you type of thing. But, you know, it's, it's I was fighting for, you know, somebody that I loved and, somebody that, you know, my children, you know, their father. Um, I have a blended family. So I was Tony's third wife. And I was so blessed that the other older boys' moms were completely engaged, completely helped me out, would take my kids for the weekend so that Tony and I could get that time together that was just us. And I always said that our time in the hospital was our time. And our 10th wedding anniversary was in the hospital. They gave us the corner suite with a cake. They brought us cake. They heard it was our 10th wedding anniversary. It's those little things that mattered, you know, and, and, and that's what I treasure. And that's what I have to remember. Um, all the other stuff, it didn't. So treasure those moments. That's Thank yeah, you. I like to say too, plugging in, I met Christy a couple months after Jeremy got sick. I let her download a lot of information into me because she'd done the journey. And I'm so glad she went through all that, looking up everything the first time, because I let her just pour that into me. I was like, I'm not doing it. Download it into me. <laughs> um, I think it's, as a caregiver in controlling, you want to take care of everything, but you have to put your hands up and say, no, I got to let somebody in. I got to let somebody talk to me. I got to plug in to somebody. I had Christy. I had a couple other people, people I've never met in real life that journeyed along with me and I was vulnerable with them and I let them know what was happening because they had been through it. And, and I think it's important to use those people and those, those things that come into your life. Don't try to do it all on your own because you will wear yourself down. And if you wear yourself down, you are, you cannot do the best, um, the best thing for your family or the person that you love that you're trying to take care of. You have to let people come alongside you. And it's hard because control freaks, um, have a hard time letting that go. But as, as someone who did let go and let people pour into me like Christy and, um, and still having to let people pour into, I think that's important as a caregiver to let go and let people download and help you through that. Thank you, Tanya. Um, Julie, do you wanna talk about being a caregiver and maybe even speak about the other caregivers that maybe were in your own experience, if there were any? Well, again, our experience was so we had this very rapid scenario and um, being able to share with my other children what was happening and share my emotion. Um, I just really leaned, I had lots of family and leaned on my husband um, 
on a day-to-day -day basis. And then really, I guess, you know, the majority of time, I think from a stress perspective, it was a very um, a stressful number of years with the anticipation what was going to happen with him. And in between all of that, um, caring for him, but it really came after his surgery. That was just an ordeal unto in itself, you know? So uh, he's a kid and uh, he wasn't even in a senior in high school yet. Um, and, uh, you know, we just found ways to do it. I, I, I finally am backing off and letting him try to be, <laughs> try to be his own person, but um, I, I, I got myself the necessary support I needed so I could support him as he needed. And um, we surrounded ourselves with family and friends and work played a vital role also in the support for me to, to let me do what I needed to do with my family. And um, so you, you lean on everybody who'll let you and uh, you're better for it. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much. The, you know, I think it's so important, regardless of what your support system looks like, right? Being comfortable leaning on them, um, you know, knowing that you're not alone, that you have people in your corner, um, even if it's not traditional support, you know, I think it could be um, amazing either way. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the importance of being aware of stomach cancer in general, because I do think that part of this program too is sharing your all of your experiences and making others aware of stomach cancer and, and the different types of stomach cancer. We have very different experiences here. So can we talk about why it's so important besides awareness, why it's so important to advocate for, um, you know, for treatment for stomach cancer, for screening options um, and all of these things? Hope, hope. I mean, I say it all the time, advocating on Capitol Hill or not just in Capitol Hill, but in the hospitals and, and you know, the, the local doctor's office, right? It's not gonna bring Tony back. It's not gonna bring Jamie back, you know? Um, it's, I could go on a list of names, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna turn it into one of those. But my kids, Julie's, thank God, thank God Julie knew about stomach cancer. Heaven forbid how you had to learn about it, but thank God, right? And you were prepared. There's hope in that, right? And my kids are going to have to get tested. Tony's was not genetic, but it's the exact same kind. So they have to get endoscopies and you should hear me. I'm, I'm awful. Like now, you know, Anthony's 29 years old. I'm like, son, have you gotten your day? starting stomach check. Do you know what I mean? Like, come on now, um, grown man. And I'm, and I'm having to have the conversations with their fiancés and wives because it's like, they're just like their father. Um, <laughs> but I want there to be a family that walks into a doctor's office one day and is told, we have a cure for you. There's hope. You know, um, what if, what if that grant is, is the key, you know? The young doctor that comes out of medical school, it's not a popular cancer, but they hear about a research grant that they can get and they stumble across that thing. You know, the day that that happens, I'm going to, I'm going to jump through the roof. I, there doesn't need to be any more, any more stories. There doesn't need to be any more funerals. There doesn't need to be any more kids that are growing up without a parent, any more siblings growing up without children. Like there's, I lost my brother to cancer. Like I, I know what Julie's kids are going through. It stinks, you know, like it's hope for me. That's, that's me. Yeah, I think for me, um, advocating, it's, it's where I can contribute. I can't change the scenario that my husband went through. I can't change that my kids don't have a father. But if I could change the path someone else has to walk through, then it wasn't for nothing. So if advocating and bringing awareness to it allows, similar to what I had, I was able to go on and find Debbie's dream. That was because people like Christy advocated. It was because Debbie, though in her own illness, said, I need to do something for the next person. And, and you're not, it's not going to stop with me. It's got to keep on going. And then Julie found out what she found out because of Debbie's dream. So it is about paying it forward. And then if you look back to when Debbie started, to everything that's happened with Debbie's dream now, it has vastly impact in such a positive manner 
so many people, how do you not want to be part of that to know that somebody that is going to be diagnosed or know something two, three, five, ten 10 years from now is because you stepped up and, and you weren't quiet about it. You didn't keep your mouth shut and it's not a fun. Yeah. It's not, it, it's not publicized stomach cancer. You see the stomach pins. Everyone's like, what does that mean? Yeah. Talk about it because people need to know there's virtually zero symptoms or like with Julie's son, he had symptoms, but they said, there's no way a kid that young is going to have something like this. And that advocating and opening awareness to that so that somebody else does not have to go through what we went through is 100% the reason why I brought my kids to, to Washington, D.C. as girls and, um, and had an actual congressman sit them down and say, don't be afraid to come talk to us. We work for you. And I needed my girls to, to know that, to hear that, that it, it is our job to, to, to open our mouth and speak for those that come behind us. Because we know what's happening. We know better. And when you know better, you do better. And that's what we're doing now. We're going to advocate because we know better. So, yeah, like Tanya was saying, it's that was so frustrating. We were getting blood work. We were, he wasn't eating right. He was feeling full. He was losing weight. Okay, let's go. Let's go see a specialist. We go see a specialist and they check him out. And his stomach looks like he's got gastritis and you know the, the this type of cancer stomach cancer is in the line diffused in the lining of the stomach so you cross your fingers if you're taking biopsies that you got you know where might there might be some cancer cuz nope his were all negative so here's a prescription go get some you know pepsit and uh, you know come back in a few months and and you walk away going okay thank goodness you know because cancer i tell you it it's always in your head, right? And their grandfather had stomach cancer, but he was 60 years old and he smoked. So no genetics there, obviously there was, but when you're running through that and you're, you've got these feelings like this, this can't, what is this? And then you hear a doctor tell you gastritis, here you go. And you're like, okay, good. And you want to run with that because you don't want it to be anything else but you steal your gut and then now his back hurts. Now, now he's having trouble breathing. And so, you know, you're doing your job, but you know, being seen, having awareness from a medical perspective, understanding that something like stomach cancer that is very deadly, but it's in a much smaller group of people. And now we've seen it in younger people. That information needs to trickle down to the medical profession. And the any kind of awareness, certainly what Debbie Stream is doing, advocating on Capitol Hill, all of those things position it to get information to those professionals, as well as parents, because at the end of the day, you've got to advocate. So when you're hearing information that you're maybe not necessarily 100% on, you speak up, you got to speak up, you got to talk more assertive, you got to say, check this for me, do an ultrasound or do a CT or I need, I need you to do more when your gut is telling you something more, but it's truly any kind of the advocacy that's taking place will spread the word to, to all fronts, to families, to, to the medical profession and the genetic testing as well. If you've got a family who um, has more than one person who's had stomach cancer and or women who have breast cancer, it's generally four or five people in with stomach cancer before they go, wait, maybe this is genetic. And by then these people who have stomach cancer have families and they have families and then you find it's genetic and now you've got you know, kids who are babies who will eventually need to be tested because you know, there's these three generations, you know, that are, that have the gene. So it's awareness, it's it's understanding that this is what can happen. And, and it's through the organization that we can get that information out there. Yeah, I think it's empowering to take our tragedy. Yeah. And so that somebody's got it. I think it's empowering. And I, and I wanted that for my kids too. I can't, we cannot change the outcome but for us, but we can make a difference going forward. And I think everybody, I think everybody um, has a responsibility in whatever their knowledge base is, anything. If you have information on something, it is our responsibility to advocate for whatever that is so that we make it better for generations to come. And ours just happens to be stomach cancer because that's where we lost our loved ones. 
Tony, I'm so glad you said that because if you remember um, the last advocacy day before COVID, um, all of us were there, the three of us, and how many kids were there? We opened it up for people to start bringing their kids. And it was, people were talking about their grandparents and their, their moms and their dads and their siblings. And, you know, I say this all the time, when you, when you take a group of people that have been through a tragedy and you put them in a room together, you create a support system, you create a support network. But now the next person that comes in has that support network. If we all said, we lost them. All right, we're on to the next chapter of our life. Um, Tony said, and I quote, I want people to benefit from my suffering. So there you go. And it's keeping his legacy going. That's what he wanted. And that's the one thing that I can do. But I was so happy to see all those kids. Uh, and they, they were like teenagers, right? They're not kids, kids. But I think Aiden was the youngest. He was 11 at the time. But they were standing in front of these congressional leaders talking about their loved ones and saying, hey, like I have a voice. And I don't know any senators that are going to tell a kid no. So, you know, <laughs> it was kind of great. Um, but the empowerment, yeah. yeah, the empowerment. We gave our kids power. They they didn't have power over watching. Um, her kids didn't have power. My kids well, over watching their dad slowly die over time. Their personalities change. Bits and pieces mm -hmm. were lost, and and they had zero control. But you know what? You do have control over your mouth. You have the control to explain to somebody what you watch your dad go through, and that you are taking time out of your day and stopping your life to go in Washington to speak to people because you know it's important. And I think that you cannot put a price tag on that type of empowerment for adults or for children. I think it's a game changer in how we deal with stuff. Um, and Jeremy, when he was first diagnosed, he was a firefighter and um, his stomach cancer is deemed to be from exposure from the job. And his big thing is I have to protect my brothers. We have to. So we went straight from Washington to the state of Florida to change laws here in Florida um, to protect firefighters who get cancer, certain list of cancers, because I said, it can't be for nothing. You're not going to die for nothing. Somebody's going to have an easier road because of this. And the only way you're going to have an easier road is if we speak and we advocate and we stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. And if I didn't have someone like Christy come alongside me within a couple of months um, of being diagnosed, my journey would have been different. And I want to know that whoever comes behind me, when they reach out to me, they're not doing it alone. And um, I think that's really important. And that's empowerment for us. Absolutely. And I hear, I mean, so much advocacy, which is just so important, not only advocacy for loved ones, but self-advocacy, you know, empowerment. I think that really taking, Tanya, like you said, tragedy and, you know, taking the power from this, becoming empowered to share stories, to spread awareness, you know, to give the power back to your family to um, encourage them to become empowered with this information. So, you know, I think it is it is amazing what Debbie Stream has been doing and will continue to do um, on the advocacy front um, in terms of spreading awareness because it's 100% needed on many many levels. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna continue here with the questions. We're gonna break it up a little bit now. Um, again, a little bit more specific. Uh, so we're gonna start, Christy, with you. If that's okay. Um, and really, I want to ask about um, you know to share a little bit about blogging about your experience, right? Because I do think that everyone has different outlets for expressing themselves and sometimes, you know, you need to write. And I think it's really amazing that you did this. Yeah, so I'm actually, I want to I wanna tell a teeny tiny story real quick. Um, when I was uh, seven, um, I learned that my grandfather, well, my grandfather had recently passed away, but I learned that he was a writer, like a published writer. And I used to always like to write. And um, apparently, now I don't really remember this, but apparently like in first grade when I was seven, I wrote about my my dead brother. I had another brother who had passed from, from SIDS. And um, so I had written about it. So upset the teacher so much that she called my mom. <laughs> and my mom was like, no, she writes about that stuff. And when I was 10, I was given a diary and, you know, dear diary, right? So I, I had one of those with the little lock. Um, so writing was a passion for me, but it was also an outlet and it was a way for me to be vulnerable and, and just kind of get whatever I was feeling out on paper and nobody else had to see it. And it didn't matter what I said, it was just a way to get things out. Um, so I did, I started a blog when, when Tony was initially diagnosed and I sat down and I just started writing like, you know, how did we tell our kids or, you know, we think it's an ulcer and, you know, da, 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 and just like every step. 
Um, and, you know, I was excited because, you know, I'd get like 100 hits and then like 500 hits and, you know, whatever. And, and as Tony, um, you know, didn't get better after the initial treat, like, you know, the first six months of treatment, the stomach removal, the chemo, the radiation, all that stuff, he wasn't really getting any better. And so I would, I'd write, but, you know, there really wasn't any like major stuff going on. Um, but when his cancer came back, I found myself writing a lot more and I was just pouring out my heart. Like I'd put my headphones on, I'd play the music and I would just start typing. Um, and now it's a book. Now it's a book and, and it's published and it's out there to help others through everything, you know, and that's all I want to do is I want to help somebody through the same journey that it's okay to cry and it's okay to be angry. And if you find out that they're not going to make it, go renew those wedding vows and go on that cruise and, and go do those things you've always wanted to do and make sure you have a will, like do your estate planning. It doesn't mean you gave up hope. All these things that I learned over seven years that I didn't realize I was learning it until I actually went back and read what I wrote. And what meant so much to me wasn't that like, you know, someone said, oh, wow, you know, Christy, you're a really good writer or anything like that. I didn't, that didn't care. It was, you helped me. I'm so glad you told me, you shared that experience because then they went and did the same thing. And then they had that experience. And that at the end of the day is what matters. It's helping others, you know? Um, and I didn't, I didn't know that writing was going to turn into what it turned into. I didn't know that that picture I took of, that's on the front cover of my book of Tony fishing was like one of the last healthy pictures we ever took it was a family fishing trip. Um, but you know, like I, I started a new one after he passed. I started one about the widow journey and that's a whole other panel <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but um it's just, it was a way to keep people posted, but it was more importantly a way for me just to kind of let, let out those emotions and be raw. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Christy. Um, I will now turn it to Tanya and ask a um, question just specific to your experience. Um, so a question that we do get a lot would be informing your children's school or informing the people um, of activities, you know, coaches, you know, anything like that. Did you, um, how did you approach that? Did you mention anything to the school? How did you kind of navigate that in their academics? Yeah, um, we had just, um, a few months before Jeremy was diagnosed, we had just actually took my middle daughter out of traditional public school and she was homeschooled. So luckily, I found out myself, but my um, youngest one was, um, she actually entered preschool after his diagnosis. And we, I am very upfront with them. I didn't want them caught off guard either because I don't want my daughter to feel, or my kids to feel they have to shelter what they say. And even now in school, I formed them right off the bat. Hey, her, her dad has passed away and I don't want her to feel like she can't talk about it. So I, I I need them to do their best job. And the best way they're gonna do their job is if they know all the information, and I tell people all the time, I know this is not something comfortable you want to hear, but this is what we're dealing with because I don't want you caught off guard by my four-year-old who doesn't have a filter. They don't understand. They'll just blurt that stuff out in the middle of a grocery store. Um, I mean, and she has. She would be like, this is my mom. This is my sister. My dad is dead. This is my other sister. So casually. So I don't want anybody to be caught off guard. So yeah, I did make sure that they knew. My oldest daughter was also in virtual school, but I didn't know how it was going to affect her um schooling I didn't know if she was going to um start missing some things start being a little bit more forgetful with assignments so I did want her teachers to have a little bit more grace with her maybe touch base with me if you see something changing in my child um and I think that's where the big thing was if I, I can see what's happening at home but I'm not plugged in the way my kids are outside of home so I need to let them know what's happening so that they can be more aware and tell me, reach out to me and say what the changes that they're seeing in my kids. So I think it's very important that we do arm the people that look after our kids with information as well so that they can be, um, you know, helpful to our children. Definitely. Thanks, Tanya. Mm -hmm. 
All right. And last but not least, Julie, I wanted to finish off with a question for you. And I know we kind of touched on this um, a little bit already, but I think it's such an important topic. I kind of want to circle back, which is just, you know, for young adults being diagnosed with cancer, I think a lot of times they feel they don't have a voice within the healthcare system, or they feel like what they're experiencing um, is minimized or overlooked. And I just would love to hear just um, what advice you would give to a young adult that is experiencing persistent symptoms and feels like maybe no matter what they say, they're not getting the attention that they deserve. So um, the, the, my, my best advice is, is, you know, your body. And if you're feeling things are not quite right, then generally speaking, we go try to get that resolved. And similar to hearing the, the gastritis and wanting to run with it, you know, for the hills, um, I, my gut still kind of told me. So listening to your instincts and your body, um, don't doubt that there it's, it's your, your, you have all the information, right? It's, it's listening to yourself. It's, it's, it's scary. You don't want to listen to it because you don't like what you're, what's popping into your head. And that is super hard to look at. Um, but we have to, our parents advocate for us. We need to advocate for ourselves. It's harder when you're younger. Um, and if you're not sure, talk to people, talk to your parents, just say, you know, it just explain that your gut's telling you something's not right because sometimes we just need that help. And there are lots of amazing doctors and there are a lot of doctors that are more focused in some areas than others. And there are doctors who specialize in certain types of things. So if you are getting information from your doctor and you're just like, I'm not satisfied with it, you don't have to stop there. If you think it's a stomach related or what other body part it may be, there are doctors who specialize in that there that you can continue on and, and look at and, and try to seek more help. Or you can connect with organizations like Debbie's Dream. And you ask a question because I asked the question. I thought, I thought our nightmare was over when we lost my son and it just was like, ah, is there something in my house that caused him to get cancer? You know let's type in stomach cancer. And then, you know, you, you get into a group and you say, Hey, my, my son's 20 years old. He passed away from stomach cancer. And the alarm sounded off with everybody in the group that get your other kids tested for genetics. And so it's not even just about the doctors. It's, it's validation from other people, right. And other, another, and organizations that, that kind of know what you're feeling and here's what you probably should check out. And that helps give you some, um, confidence when you're doubting yourself but at the end of the day listen to yourself listen to your heart know your body and if you're not quite satisfied with your information keep going there's there's lots more and exhaust that and rule things out and if your biopsies are negative go do it one more time and and you know just advocate for yourself and get aggressive with the doctors if the more assertive you are they'll trust me they're going to want to run every test on you because they want you to stop so um you know especially if you're saying it they they'll do it you know so that being the best advice just don't doubt yourself you got all the answers sometimes we don't want to listen to it though and that's totally normal Thank you so much, Julie. I think that was an amazing way to wrap up our session here. Um, and I want to thank you all for sharing such amazing experiences and for really giving our, you know, our viewers and our listeners a piece of what you've all experienced and hopefully they can take it and learn, um, you know, from everything that we've learned tonight that we've heard from tonight. Before we wrap up with just a few minutes left, I did want to see if there were any questions out there um, for anyone that is watching. And, and if there aren't, that is okay as well. Um, so I will just see if there are any questions coming in. And I don't think so. Um, so um, is there any, any last thoughts you know, from our panelists? Anything else that you wanna share before we end tonight? Sarah, if I could just end on this, and Erin, we can try end, but there's no rule. Um, so if you're a parent out there that 
is, is dealing with what we've all experienced. There's no rules. There's no right way. There's no wrong way to do it. You're amazing. Um, your loved one is so lucky to have you. Your kids are lucky to have you. And um, if, they're, if they're driving you nuts, then you're doing absolutely amazing because that means that they're still living and they're still being kids and, and they're still going to do all those things like not do their homework. Um, but I was so wrapped up the first time by keeping everything so strict and I was wrong. I was wrong. And I, I love the fact that I didn't have any rules, um, the, the second go around. So just, you know, you're not alone in this. And if, you know, you're part of Debbie stream, like, or you're not like join us, you can reach out to any one of us. We'll be here to, to talk to you. And even if you're not part of Debbie stream, we're here to talk to you as well. Um, but no rules. So don't, you can't break anything if there's no rules. Yeah, I would just quickly say there's, there's, there's so many of us out there um, that are here and, and want to help, want to talk to you. Could, it could be a silly question, you may think, um, but we're accessible on Facebook and through the organization. So any kind of questions or just random things that from the, even if it doesn't, you don't think it's important. There's, there's lots of answers and support you have, and you can literally text any one of us and, and get help. Let us download what we know into you, and save you guys the trouble of all the legwork. So, well, thank you all so much, and thank you for those that are listening and with us tonight. We really appreciate you. Um, and for more information, please check out Debbie Stream uh, Foundation, also Cancer Care. We offer we both offer free services and support, um, so we are happy to be there for you as a resource. Okay, everyone, have a great night. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.